super excited about today and Casey said it already, Sarah probably said it, I'll say it again, if this is your first time at Meadows Church, welcome home. We are so excited that you're here, and we are so excited about what God is going to do in you today, because he's going to do something. You believe that? You believe God's going to show up here and do something in you? He is, I promise you. I promise you. We're in a series called The Core, say The Core. The core is what? It's the center of something. And we believe that if we place what's valuable to God and at his center, the center of who we are, we're going to be a lot closer to our God-given purpose. And God has revealed things. Last week's message, I've never heard, had more feedback on a message in my life. If you're new or you missed last week, man, check it out. It's all about taking risks. It, it was unbelievable. So, um, but let's get to today with a question. How many of you have ever walked into an environment, into a place, and you immediately felt like you just weren't welcome? You ever, you ever had that? Raise your hand. Yeah, I can't be alone up here because it just happened to me. Like recently, I walked into an environment and it was cold. And it, like, people looked at me like I didn't belong. Now, granted, it was a woman's restroom, so that's my bad. Okay, I just got to get better. But it was, okay, I'm like, whatever, you know, get, make, make your sign bigger, you know. But uh, here, here's where I'm getting at. Sometimes, even in the church, a place where I believe should be the most welcoming place in the world, I can't believe how many people I talk to. Now, I've never really experienced it. I guess I've been fortunate. But a lot of people have been to churches where you have maybe felt you're not welcome or you're not a part of the club or whatever. You just felt, it felt cold. I grew up like I grew up in a church that was traditional, left the church for many years, came back 11 years ago, found Christ at a church that was very welcoming. So I, I, that's what I'm used to. I'm used to a church loving me and hugging me and just like I was all messed up and they just keep welcoming me, me home. And that's what Meadows does too. In fact, our welcome to one of our seven core values is that hopefully you feel welcome, welcome and loved. Like when you walked in here, by the time you pulled in the parking lot to the time you sat your butt in the chair, I hope you felt the love. I hope you did. You know, we've had some host team members go overboard, though. We had a couple, you know, sometimes they'll hug too tightly or, you know, if they start to kiss you, let me know. We'll talk to them. I mean, we go over the top sometimes, but we believe highly in a big, in a big welcome. And uh, I hope you felt that. And the reason I say that is because as church people and as Christians, some of you are followers of Jesus, some of you are not. I'm glad you're both here. Thank God. Sometimes as church people, I'll speak for, for me, we forget where we've been. And the longer that we're following Jesus, the more we forget where we've been. And sometimes I think we're guilty, I'll speak for me, I'm guilty of expecting people to believe a certain way or behave a certain way before they can belong. And that's a mistake. That's a huge mistake, and this is what we're talking about today. Um, and, and let's be honest, come on, even if you're following Jesus, we don't always behave, do we? I mean, somebody said, you, should, you, you guys should get bumper stickers for your car. And I know how I drive. I don't want to put a metals bumper sticker on my car. People will run from that. I'm a jerk when it comes to driving. God's working on my heart, okay? I'm not patient when it comes to driving. Every week, God puts me behind people that drive horribly slow, okay? They have no agenda. They don't, they're going somewhere, not fast, but slow. And I don't get it. I'm like, God, why are you doing this? And then it gets worse because they'll approach a stoplight. And the stoplight just turns yellow. Well, we know what you do, right? When you approach, when you hit a yellow stoplight, you speed up. You don't slow down. You don't stop. I just, okay, pray for me. Okay? I don't understand. So God's working on my heart with that. But we forget, we forget, and we, I think sometimes we, we think we got our lives together. And I don't know about you, but I don't. And uh, I, I'm so far from where I need to be, but I'm not where I used to be. And I don't know what you're going on in your life today, but I'm telling you that God wants to do something supernatural in your life today. And this message, we're going to get into God's word. And what I'm, going to, what I'm going to pull apart are some stories that Jesus tells. And they're stories about something that is lost. You ever lost? Like, you ever raise your hand, you ever lost your cell phone? Don't leave me hanging. I know you have. You probably lost it this morning. How many of you are like me? And when you lose your cell phone, we're smart enough to leave it on vibrate or silent, which makes it extra difficult to find. It's awesome. I do that all the time. Car keys. Who loses their car keys? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do that too. I probably have one up to you, though. I've actually lost my entire car. True story. True. Now, this is before I was walking with Jesus. Don't judge me. But in my early 20s, um, lived kind of a wild lifestyle, and me and some guys were out partying, and uh, I was trying to be responsible, so we got wild, we got crazy, and I got a ride home. So I lived in an apartment with another dude. We worked at the same place. So I get home, and I wake up the next day, and I'm like, well, I know my car's not here. So my roommate worked where I did, so I jumped in his vehicle, got a ride to work. It was great. So I'm like, this is awesome. Uh, the next, uh, that night, 
Didn't pick my car up because I thought, you know what, I've left it there before. They ain't going to tow it. So the next day, being lazy, I jumped in with my roommate again, got a ride to work with him and got a ride home. And I thought, okay, it's been two days. I should probably go get my car. So he drives me to go get my car. It ain't there. So I talked to the guys that own the place. And I'm like, you guys ain't towing cars, are you? They're like, no, no. I'm like, hmm, let me think here. I said, let's go back to the other, because I thought, tried to retrace my steps where we were that night. And I said, well, let's go back to the other club where we're at. Maybe, maybe I left it there. Went to that club, no car. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've lost my vehicle? This is serious. So I, I, I didn't know what to do. Like, I had no clue where it was. So we get back to the apartment, and I'm racking my brain. And I'm, it's embarrassing, so I'm not like, I'm, you know, I don't want to tell people I've lost my car. So my roommate looks at me, he goes, well, <laughs> and our garages are, are not attached to the apartment. You know how apartments work. So he goes, have you checked the garage? I said, you think I'm dumb enough to not know if I drove my car home? And he looks at me like, I'm like, all right, good point. Go check the garage. There it is in the garage. Park straight as an arrow. Unbelievable. And I'm telling, so I, yeah, I drove home. Okay. So I say that to tell you that God is incredibly, he, he's guided my life in so many ways, you guys. I could be in prison. I, I, I'm not saying that even to be funny. That is true. So God is my, God's hand, and he protects us all the time, all the time. And I think about, here I am, I drove that vehicle home and had no clue I did. And I think of the life that I lived and how I was, and maybe you're living a life that's kind of out of control yourself. Maybe it's not in regards to partying, but maybe it's in relationships, or maybe it's in finance, or, or, or maybe it's just in your mind or on the computer. I'm telling you something. You're, you're looking at a, a guy who lived a life where, again, I don't deserve a platform at all, I don't think. God's just been so good. But if he can take a guy like me and, and give me a platform, what do you think he wants to do in you? And you might think, because I'm not okay. I, there's so much of me that is not still okay. God's working on me. And maybe you're not okay. And maybe you're living that life like I talked about that I lived. And you're struggling. And you're, there's areas where you're defeated. I, I want to help you understand something. That you've stepped into an environment today. You've stepped into a church today where it's okay to not be okay. We'll, I'll say it again. It is okay to not be okay. If you're not okay today, welcome home. But guess what? Because of Jesus Christ and his, and his power, you don't have to stay that way. God wants to do something in your life today. But I'm telling you, God, he's amazing. He's powerful. And God loves going after lost things. And if you, So if you brought a Bible or a mobile device, go to Luke 15. Luke is in the New Testament. And, and, and the Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That starts the New Testament. And if you don't have a mobile device or a Bible, we'll put it up on the screen as well. But if you need a Bible, we want to give you one at guest services today for free. I want to give that to you because it's so important. Like during the series, many of you committed to reading 10 minutes a day in God's Word. If you're doing that, good job. If you've gotten off track, today's the day you can get back on track. But So Luke 15, I'll set it up. Jesus in Luke 15 tells three stories. All three stories... Um, are similar. So the reason he starts telling these stories because the Bible says in Luke 1, I don't think I have this up there. Yeah, Luke 11. But Luke 1, I'll set this up. Um, people that were like me most of my life were hanging out with Jesus and loved it. Like sinners and drunkards and losers and heathens and prostitutes. And they loved hanging out with Jesus. And the religious people, the church folk, were like, well, why... What's the deal? Why, why are you doing that? Why do you hang out with them? And Jesus says, I need to tell you a story. Because Jesus talked in parables. And there are stories that he would tell to try to illustrate a point. In, in the first story, he talks about the lost sheep. Some of you, if you grew up in the church, you heard the parable. Jesus says, if a, if a shepherd has 100 sheep and one wanders off, wouldn't that shepherd leave the 99? Because the 99 are together. They're safe. They're in a cluster. Wouldn't the shepherd leave the 99 and go after the one? And then after he gets the one, he takes it back. And don't they celebrate and rejoice? In fact, the end of that story, I'll read it real quick because I have it pulled up here. It says, at the very end, he tells the story of the 99 and the one. And then he says, in the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents. Say repent. Some of you might not even know what that word means. That's okay. I didn't either. I'll tell you what it means before you leave today. One sinner who repents and returns to God. Then over the 99 that, that, that never strayed. That, so he tells his first story of the lost sheep. Then Jesus tells a second story to this, to this crowd. And he says, what if a woman has 10 coins and they're very, very valuable and she loses a coin? He says, won't she sweep the entire house? Won't she look at every nook and cranny to find that one coin? And when she finds it, he says, she will call her friends and she will call her family and they will rejoice. And then he says after that story, the same thing. Jesus is telling the same thing. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. They repent. 
Repent. What's he mean? Repent. And then he gets to the story we're going to talk about today. Some of you, if you grew up in the church, you might be familiar with the parable of the prodigal son or the lost son. I, I, I almost want to rename it. To me, it's more like the parable of the loving father. And you're going to understand why in just a moment. The third story Jesus tells, Jesus is trying to make a point. Why would he tell three stories that are all similar? Why, why he's doing that is Jesus is saying to you and I and to them that there, this is extremely important to me. Like, like the Bible's important, and what Jesus says is really, really cool. But, but he, anytime he tells three stories and it all parallels around the same thing, he is desperately wanting, to, wanting us to understand what is at the core of who he is, the center of who he is. That's why he's illustrating it three times. Here's the story for today. We're going to start in the 11th verse. Jesus says, I'm going to illustrate it one more time. To point further, this matters so much to me, he tells a story. A man has two sons. The youngest son told the dad, I want my share of my stuff. I want my estate now before you die. Normally, they would always wait for the father to die. Then they divide up the assets. That's what's customary in this time. But the son says, screw that. I want it now. I'm not waiting. Give it to me now. And, and the, and the uh, screw that. That's not actually the right translation. That's more like the Monty translation. But this, it doesn't say that in the Bible, just in case you're wondering. So I got to, my wife's like, some of the things you say. I know, sweetie, I'm working on it. So, uh, so his father agreed to divide the wealth between the sons. Father says, okay, that's what you want. I'm going to give it to you. Verse 13, a few days later, the younger son packed all of his stuff. He had all of his cash. He had his stuff from his dad. He moved to a distant land. So the son has moved, the younger son, and he wasted everything. He blew through all the money. He, it, it says he wasted all the money on wild living. Now, we've, of course, we've never done that, have we? I've never lived a wild life. I mean, I wonder if this dude, like, forgot his camel, where he parked his camel for three days, probably. Heathen. So uh, anyway, so he, he, he did what a lot of us do. He, he, he lived his own life. He went crazy. And you'll see if you're taking notes, which I always encourage, there's three lines. The three lines represent three stages in this story. And the first line is what I just described to you, the younger son. He is in a place of rebellion. Okay? This is a place of rebellion. People that are, most people that are in rebellion, they don't have a clue they're in rebellion. Did you know that? They have no clue. You could write in parentheses next to rebellion, write lost. That's what he is. The son is lost. Most people that are lost in the world today, in America or outside America, they have no clue. They're, if you ask them, are you lost or found? They don't have a clue. They would not tell you, oh, I'm lost. When I was walking away from Jesus, and I believed in Jesus all my life, I would, I've never considered myself, well, I'm lost. I'm away from the flock. I'm not part of Jesus. I, I tell you all day long, God loves me. I believe in Jesus. I'm good to go. I would have told you that all day long. Rebellion. Verse 14. He's in this rebellion, and he's blown through everything, and it says about that time his money ran out, and a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. So he persuaded a local farmer, had to beg him probably. They knew the guy. He had a reputation. He's the partier. He's the one going, you know, hiring all the women, doing what he does. And we know he did that because we'll find out he did, did that. And he had to beg a guy that he knows, please, just give me a chance, just hire me. The guy hires him on, sent him to feed the pigs, which would be repulsive. Pigs in this time were very unclean. I don't know if they're still, I don't think they're really clean now. But I mean, they were, they were considered, you wouldn't, Jews would have been a Jewish uh, guy in the parable. Jews would never associate with pigs. They certainly wouldn't be hanging out in the pen with them, feeding them, which was his job. But that's where he was in life. That's where re rebellion led him. He's with the pigs. The young man became so hungry that the pods that he was feeding the pigs, the pig food, was looking good to him. But no one gave him anything. Verse 17. When he finally came to his senses, this, that's a key verse. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, back where I left with my dad and everything, my brother, man, even the people that they hire, the servants, they have enough to eat and they have food to spare. And I'm here dying of hunger. It's interesting. He's in a place of desperation. So the son, and I like how it says he said to himself. You know why he said it to himself? There ain't no one else around. Okay, he's burnt bridges. You know, he had friends when he had the money. He had followers when he had the, when, when he had the following, when he had the popularity, when he could do something for them. But as soon as he couldn't do anything for them, you know, that's how you know who you got, if you got a friend or not. They were gone. And he's by himself. It's interesting. It's, you see, it's in times of desperation that remind us that we cannot do life alone. I'll say it again. In times of desperation, he's reminded, I need somebody in my life. Wait, my dad. Wait, my brother. Wait, my friend. He's, he's reminded. And it's this desire. When the desire becomes greater than your dysfunction, 
When your desire becomes greater than your disability, this is when you're going to find hope. This is when you're going to find healing. And he's at this tipping point. Some of you, you're at that tipping point right now. You're at the tipping point, and God is like, gosh, if I can get your desire here, you're going to start to gravitate. I'm going to start to do something in your life. And this is what God did with him. He, he wanted hope. He wanted healing. And he says to himself in verse 18, he says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go home to my dad. Dad, I've sinned against both heaven and you. That's key. A lot of times we think when we hurt somebody or we, 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 we um, uh, lie to somebody or uh, do something bad to somebody. We want, it, we want their forgiveness. But we, don't, we rarely think about God and how sin grieves the heart of God. See, the son understands that he's sinned against both people, his dad, and his heavenly father. I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. He's not even asking to be really part of the family. Just, just let me be a slave. Just let me just hang out with you. Just let me get some food. Just, just a little bit. So then he thought about it, but he just didn't think about it. He acted on it. Oh, that's key. That is key. If thoughts don't eventually turn into actions, nothing changes. So he returned to the Father. And while he was still a long way off, it's one of the most beautiful lines you'll ever read in Scripture. While the Son was still a long way off, the Father saw him coming. How? How would the Father see him coming? Because the father was out looking for the son. I can imagine every day the father going out. This son hurt the father bad. This son, this son had nothing to do with his dad. Every day the dad goes out to the end of the driveway and he looks and he waits. And he's not just sitting home wondering. He's out searching and looking and begging and wanting. And one day his dream came to true. One day the son, he saw the son coming. And the father says he's filled with love and compassion. What? But the son, the son basically said, I want nothing to do with you. Give me mine. I'll forget you, forget the family, forget the brother, forget the business. I'm doing my own thing. Wouldn't the, I mean, okay, shouldn't you be filled with like resentment or unforgiveness or anger? But the father, the father's filled with love and compassion. Not only that, but he runs to the son. He embraces the son. He kisses the son. And his son says, Dad, I've sinned against both heaven, against God and you. I'm no longer worthy to even be called your son. He's, the, the, this is a key moment. The son has moved to, from a place of rebellion to repentance. Say repentance. Repent. Repentance. What does it mean, pastor? What are you talking about? He's found. He went from lost to found. Repentance is key. What does that mean? It means you've changed your mind and you've changed your behavior and you're going a different way. You're not just thinking about it. You're not just hoping about it. You're doing something about it. Remember when he said, um, I, I, gosh, maybe I'll go say this to my dad. I'll do this. He hadn't repented yet. You know what he repented? When he, started when he started walking home another direction, repentance begins. So many people miss that. It's like, I've given my life to Christ. I want to live towards Jesus, but you're still doing the same things. Well, but I gave my life to Christ. Jesus is in me. It's a partnership. It's a cooperation. When you start to do your part, he'll help you. Your, his spirit is in you. But repentance means you've got, to you've got to decide. The spirit just doesn't do it all for you. God just doesn't do it all for you. Notice the father didn't go looking for the son. He didn't go forcing him home. He didn't go grab him out of the pig pen. He didn't do that. The son had to make the decision. The son had to get out of the pig pen. The son had to go home. And the father was waiting with open arms. That is repentance. It's going a different direction. I promise you, some of you, you know you're making decisions. You know you have thoughts in your head. You know that you're doing things you shouldn't do. I'm not condemning you. I'm with you. We need help together. But I'm telling you, if you, if you take a step, God will be there. And he's waiting to equip you, help you, empower you, and strengthen you. It's what he does. It's so amazing. So he's moved into repentance. And it says this. I hit, remember the son said, I'm not worthy to be called your son. And the dad says, to the servants, quick, bring him nothing but the best. You bring him the finest robe. You bring him the best ring. You kill the fattest calf that we have. We are going to celebrate. This is, this is crazy what he's saying. He's saying we're going to party. Put sandals on his feet. Kill the calf we've been fattening. We must say must. Must. He didn't say, well, maybe we should. or maybe I'm thinking about that. He says, there is no other option. 
We must do this. We have to do this. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and now he's returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. And this is exactly, I love that line because this is exactly why Meadows will always be a church, always be a church that will look less like a funeral and more like a party. Because when lost people come home and dead things come back to life, we have something to celebrate and we won't stop. We will never stop. Three decisions for Christ. Are you kidding me? Thank you, Lord. Bring more. Bring your lost people home. God is so good. And so they move from rebellion to repentance to rejoicing. Okay? Rebellion to repentance to rejoicing. You see that in all the stories. Now, if you've ever, ever heard this message preached before, a lot of times this is where it ends. It's not where it ends today. Say there's more to the story. There really is more to the story. There really is more to the story. I want to finish out this story with you because Jesus finished it, so we should too. This is what it says. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field working. When he returned home, he heard the music, the parting, the dancing, and he's like, hey, to the servant, what's up? Well, your brother's back, and your father killed a fat calf, and we're celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was ecstatic. He couldn't believe that his younger son had come home. He couldn't wait to celebrate. He couldn't wait to embrace him. He couldn't wait to share what God's been doing. Wait, is that what it says? No, no, let me just read out of scripture. It says the older brother was angry. The older brother would not go in. His father even came out and begged him, son. Or no, excuse me, the son says, the older son says to dad, all these years, dad, I have slaved for you and never once refusing to do a single thing you told me. In that statement, the, young, the older son said it a lot. Slaved? So repentance is not just the mind, it's, it, it's, it's the will as well. So your mind has to be changed, but then your will follows. The fact that the older brother said, Dad, I've slaved for you, he, what he's telling him, I didn't even want to be here. I didn't even want to be here. I mean, I'm here. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. It's like me when I went to church growing up. I was there. I was going through the motions, but I wanted to be somewhere else. I did not want to be there. I, I, I believed in Jesus. I just didn't want to follow him, okay? Because I thought, like the young son, I thought my way was better. I did. And some days I still think that. I'm just that psychotic. Some days I'm like, well, I'm still going to try this. God's like, you can try that, but it's going to hurt. All right, well, yeah, it hurts. So why I tell you that is because the, the dad is trying to talk to the older son and tell him this is what we need to do, but the older son's not getting it. He's like, dad, but the, the fact that he used slave, he, he, he didn't want to be there at all. He was just there. He, so he's in rebellion and he didn't even know it. Let's keep going. He says, I've slaved for you and, never, and you never once, never once refused to do a single thing you told me. And in that time, you never gave me a fattened calf or a young goat or a feast or, friend, or to do with my friends. Yet when this son of yours, it's interesting that the older son would say this son of yours, he's not even associating himself with his brother. He doesn't say my brother. He says this son of yours. See, sin separates. Sin will separate you from, a lot of times from the people that are closest to you. It's what, if the devil knows if he can separate you from those that you love the most, I mean, he'll do damage. The, the brother's not even saying it's my brother. He's saying your son, well, your son, verbiage is huge comes back squandering money on prostitutes you celebrate by killing a fatted calf he leaves in rebellion and i'm stuck doing the work and you're going to celebrate him and the father in love this father is incredible look dear son you've always stayed by me and everything i have is yours remember earlier in the story it says the father divided the wealth the son already had the wealth so did the older son it didn't say that he just gave the younger son his stuff. It says right early in the story, the father divided it between them. The older son had his stuff. They can party anytime. He can have his friends over anytime. But he's living a victim mindset. Not, vic he's not living victorious in Christ. At all. At all. So let's keep going. So he says, look, you've, you've always stayed with me. And everything I have is your son. But we had, I, I love it, we had to celebrate must celebrate. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother. Now the dad's trying to get him together. He doesn't say my son. He says, your brother. He's your brother. For your brother was dead and he's come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. It's amazing in the story because the older brother, 
He is the one in rebellion. And he has no clue. None. None. This is, this is, this is, this is our country. I'll, 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 t- I'll say that. The stats will tell you eight out of ten people would say, well, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. That's great. I believe in Jesus too. But I was pretty far from him. I'm telling you, it's, it's so telling. Lost people don't know they're lost. I didn't know I was lost. I mean, we think of, all oh, the people that are atheists or agnostic. I mean, that's not what we're even talking about. The, so let me illustrate. In the story, the, the dad of the kids, that is God. The Pharisees, the church people, the religious people that have all their life together and do everything right, and they go to church, and they read their Bible, and they memorize scripture, though, you know who they are? The older son. They're lost, and they, and they think they're closest to God. They're, farther, they're the farthest from him. The young son, I mean, that's the people that know they need help. They're the people that are jacked up. People like you and like me, that, but we're just desperate. We just need help. I just don't know which way to go. God, I need you. And God says, that's what I'm here for. But the older son is in rebellion. It's interesting, in all the three stories I shared with you, the first two I touched on, and then we got deeper in this one, every one of those stories, everybody rejoiced except the older son. Remember? The shepherd finds the sheep, he rejoices. The sheep, it doesn't say the sheep rejoiced, but I bet they had their own little party. I'm just guessing. So that was great. The woman in the coin, the woman rejoiced. She called her friends and family, they rejoiced. The, 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 the father rejoices when the son comes home. The servants rejoice when the son, son comes home. The son, the younger son, he rejoices when dad throws the party. The only one who's not rejoicing is the older son. The only one. He's the one in rebellion, and he's the last person that sees it. That's what sin will do. He had no clue. I wrote this down. When we can't celebrate what God is doing in someone else's life, there's something wrong with our heart. Okay? When we can't celebrate what God is doing in someone's life, that's a good indicator we might be in rebellion. And we don't even know it. God convicts me in that area. Maybe he does you too. And, and this is what we'll say. They don't deserve it. They don't deserve it. That's what the older brother is saying. He doesn't deserve it, dad. He doesn't. De- Why don't we make him earn it back? Make him pay you back. Make him work for years and then we'll celebrate. And the dad says, we ain't waiting for nothing. What was lost is now found. What was dead is now alive. We will celebrate today. And that's scandalous when it comes to the older brother. And that's scandalous to a lot of religious people. That's why I love love our church. And the more jacked up you are, the better, I think. I just, because people that are messed up, a lot of times we know we need help, right? It's the ones who think they got it all together. That's why I tell you, you don't need to get cleaned up to come here. Just come here and Jesus will clean you up. It's what he's in the business of doing. But they don't deserve it. I would say you don't understand the grace of God. And, and, and this is something that I, I, I haven't talked a lot about grace, but you're going to hear a lot about it today. Because it is an incredible, it, it, it is key to having a relationship with Jesus Christ. What is grace? I wrote it down. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. That's grace. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. Did the son deserve a celebration? No, he didn't deserve it. He didn't deserve it, and I don't deserve what God's given me, and you don't, we really don't deserve what God's given us. We don't deserve it. We're, we're in rebellion much of our lives. And God says, because of Jesus, his righteousness, I see things differently. So the dad, who's God, sees his son differently. Because he doesn't see his son in the sin, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he says, I love you. You've come home. Let's celebrate. This is so key. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. The righteousness of Christ. Grace is also loving people before they change, not just after. Ooh. What? What? Dang, I just got serious in here. Yes, it's actually loving people while they're still posting things that they shouldn't post, still tweeting things they shouldn't tweet, still saying things they shouldn't say, still looking at things they shouldn't look like. Why aren't we giving them kind of a free pass, just saying they're covered by grace and they can do whatever they want? You're not getting it yet, but you will, I hope, before we leave today. God's grace is for people not just after they change. God's grace is for them before they change. Do you think the son who came home was just all of a sudden perfect? I mean, he lived a crazy lifestyle. I bet, I bet you he still kind of jacked up. I bet you he still needed a little bit of counseling. I bet you he still kind of wanted to do some things he shouldn't want to do. But, but the grace was waiting for him. This is, the, this is the scandalous grace of God. What you need to understand at the end of the day, God's grace is for all people. Turn to two people and tell them all people. Tell two people, all people. How many people? All people. God's grace is for all people. Because why? All people matter to God. You know what that means? We can no longer just pick and choose who's going to be deserving of God's grace and who isn't. Because if you're honest, we're guilty of doing that. I know I am. 
and, and I have to repent. I have to repent before the Lord. And when I get on my judgmental high horse and think that I'm better than somebody else or somebody doesn't deserve God's grace as much as maybe I do. There's a story. Some of you might be familiar with Jeffrey Dahmer, serial killer back in the 80s. Wasn't just a serial killer. Dude killed like 17 people, boys and men. Didn't just kill them, raped some of them, dismembered some of them, ate some of them. Say that's messed up. It's messed up. It is messed up. It is messed up. So the, 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 the story goes is that Dahmer would get arrested and go to prison. Seems like a pretty just thing to happen. Also, the, the, it's told that he would find a relationship with Jesus Christ in prison. And that Jeffrey Dahmer, this guy who did these heinous, heinous acts, would give his life to Jesus Christ in prison in 1994, early in 94. And it's also noted that he would actually lead other people to Jesus Christ in the prison. Jeffrey Dahmer? Yeah. He actually was bludgeoned to death in the prison in November of 94. That's when he died. But if he did give his life to Christ, you know what that means. Today he celebrates with Jesus in paradise. Now, if you hear that story, you think, well, that ain't right. You could have a heart problem. Okay? You could. I'm just saying. If Dahmer repented before the Lord and accepted the grace of Jesus Christ by faith, which is how you are saved, he is in heaven today. And do and, and you know what Jesus said to him? Welcome home, my son. And he loved him. And he welcomed him. What? But he did the, it was the grace of God. But doesn't that lower the bar? Doesn't that tell people, well, you're covered by God's grace, so you can, they're just going to do whatever they want, Pastor. We can't let that happen. Then you don't understand God's grace. So, I wrote this down. It's significant to note that Jesus attracted, Jesus attracted the lowest of the low. Is it because he compromised the message? Is it because he, he, he condoned their sin? Is it because he, he said, you know what, my grace covers you, just keep doing what you're doing? He did the opposite. He never condoned what they were doing, but he loved them in such a radical way, they couldn't help but want more of him. He cared for them in such a radical way that they were just, it was a magnet. Do you see that? That's what he did. He didn't lower the bar. There's a woman caught in adultery, and Jesus says, she's at his feet. And she's, she's going to get stoned because that was the punishment. And she's begging for her life. And Jesus says, let you who was without sin cast the first stone. And well, none of them can do that because they're all sinners. And he looks at the woman. And she's, she can't believe the grace that she's receiving. And Jesus says, no, go and sin no more. He didn't say, no, just go keep doing what you're doing. You're good to go. And then just repent and, you know, use my grace. And then you can just keep doing it. That's not how it works. If that's what you're, the game you're playing, you, don't, you haven't received the grace of God. That's, that's the key. His grace compels us to want to change. It's, it's amazing. What if we were that church? What if Meadows is this church that people hear about us and they're like, dang, that's the church where it's okay to not be okay? That's the church where they're not going to judge me? Where they're not going to condemn me? Where they're going to love me? They're not going to condone me if I'm in sin. They're going to call it out in love, in grace, pointing me to Jesus. What if we were this church? What if we were this church? It's, what if, what if we were a church that says, regardless of what you're tweeting, regardless of what you're posting, regardless of your political affiliation, right? Because guess what? People that affiliate with the Democratic Party, some of those people are going to be in heaven. <gasps> what? <laughs> people that associate with the Republican Party, some of them are going to be in heaven. People that, people that don't drive the speed limit, some of them... Oh, it's hard to say, but are going to be in heaven. They're just going to get there real slow. I'll guarantee you that. It's, they're in no hurry, but, but we, we got to stop judging people by what they're doing and start seeing them through the eyes of Jesus. It doesn't mean you condone what they're doing, but I, I, we, you'll never win an enemy to Jesus. I'll say that again. You will never win an enemy to Christ, ever. And until they know that you care about them and you love them, then they might give you a platform to speak into them. But until that's established, don't even try because it will not work. Jesus loved them. That's why they let him speak. That's why they let him, they're like, dang it, he's still, you don't like what I'm doing, but he loves me so much. Maybe there's something to that. Yeah, there's something to that. That's the church that we're going to be. And some of you, you know what you're thinking? Because it's what I was thinking in the church. We're going after more people that, that need Jesus. Some of you today need Jesus. I do too. I need more of him today. Don't wait. Okay, some of you, you're like, I'm not qualified. I still need help. I need healing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You might need that. I get that. 
And you're going to get that the closer you get with Jesus. But, don't, but, our, but our past sometimes gets in the way. And we think, well, pastor, I'm just, I just, I'm, I'm, God really can't use me where I'm at. I'm a felon. Okay, did you hear what I said about Dahmer? He ate people, okay? Are you eating people? If you are, don't tell me. That's weird. But, um, so, but I'm a felon. I've been divorced, pastor, numerous times. Welcome home. I've had abortions. Welcome home. I'm in addiction. <laughs> I was too. When are we going to start to understand that, that God doesn't shut the door on our future because of something that happened in our past? He doesn't. That, he does not. Welcome home. We're glad that you're here. We are so glad that you're here. You're here today because God has not given up on you. I'll say it again. God has not given up on you. So where do we go from a church or to, as we move forward? God's hand is on our church. I, I hope because we're trying to love like Jesus. Don't always get it right. I'm probably the one who probably gets it wrong most. But I'm telling you, Jesus is doing something supernatural. Our short-term goal months ago said we're going to try to get to reach more people and go to two services by Easter, which is April 21st. I'm here to tell you God's been moving in such a way in this church that we've already decided in five weeks on March 3rd, we're going from one to two services because God is not done with this city. That's what he's doing. That's awesome. That's awesome. Oh, so we can be a big church? No, because we serve a big God who's just getting started. That's why. So March 3rd, write it down. Service times will be 9 and 11. And uh, praise God for some of you that like to sleep in. You're going to love Jesus even more at 11 o'clock, I bet. So it's awesome. But, but so what do we do? What, what can you do? Here's what I'm asking you to do. Keep being bold about loving people. That's it. Start conversations with people you don't know. Get to know them, love them, and care for them. Will you do that? If you will do that, you will have opportunities to invite them here. You will have opportunities to love them. You will have opportunities to do things that only you can do. Someone's relying on you to do what you're called to do so they can come to know Jesus Christ. This is huge. Why? But why do we need to keep growing, Pastor? Because, because this is what I believe. I believe that through the church, things can get better. Well, the... The government's jacked up. Yep, yep. My house is jacked up too, so I need help. We're messed up. We need Jesus, but I see a huge opportunity for the world. The, the more messed up we get, the more I think, God, this is our time. This is the church's time. We believe that through the church, things can get better. We believe that through the church, suffering can be relieved. We believe that through the church, oppression can be lifted. We believe that through the church, sin can be defeated. We believe that through the church, human lives can be transformed through the power of Jesus Christ and his amazing grace. Do you believe it? Give God a shout if you do, because I do. He's just getting started with you. He is just getting started. He's got so much more for your life. He's not giving up on you, and he never will. If you're like me, you've given God a million reasons to stop loving you. I know I have. And he adores me. And he adores you. You've given God a million reasons to give up on you. And he keeps pursuing you. Arms wide open. Running to the sun. It's what he does. It's what he's in the business of doing. Anybody ever seen the movie The Shack? Raise your hand. You ever seen that movie The Shack? Some of you have read the book. Some of you have seen the movie. It's one of the first movies we went to as a family when we moved to Omaha. There's a scene in the movie I'm going to show you as we close. And I'll set it up. Uh, the main character in the movie is a guy named Mackenzie. Mackenzie's been dealt a tough, tough hand, like a lot of you. Some of you know my story. I was a drug addict, hit it from friends and family. Well, I should be dead right now, but here we are, right? So if there's hope for me, my God, there's hope for you. And I'm here to tell you something. In that dysfunction, what I went through, some of you have gone through way worse. Way worse. And I empathize with you. And I love you. And I will walk with you. We will walk with you. This, this story, this, this Mackenzie is his name. So he, he was beat as a kid by his dad. So he had that going against him. Some of you, you've been abused. I'm sorry for that. And if you've ever been abused through a church, I'm doubly sorry for that. There's broken people in the church. No church is perfect. We're far from it. But we love a perfect God. He will set you free. But there's no perfect church. But, but, so he's been abused by his dad. It doesn't stop there. So then he has a young daughter. She's abducted. Parents' worst nightmare. Worst nightmare happened to him. His, his daughter's abducted and murdered. So, he's, so this guy's 
ticked at God and everybody. And rightly so, I think. I mean, I would be too. So I'm setting it up for you for this scene because he's at a point where, and some of us are there, we get so hurt, it's like, oh, I'm mad at God. I'm mad at my everybody. I'm just mad. And this is where he's at, and this is so key to grace. Sometimes we blame God for things, and sometimes we get mad at God, and I've been there. Maybe you're there today. I don't know. I just know that that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That people would say, or that we would have to send a child to hell. Are we born in the image of God? Yeah. Does he want us to be a child of his? Yes. Would he ever send anybody to hell? No. He never would. Repentance, we've talked a lot about that today. The father in the story, his job was to seek and wait. The son had a job too, our job, to repent. I don't want this anymore and return. Got to do something, otherwise you're not going to find the love of the father. We think, see, contrary to what people believe, God's love doesn't save us. What? What do you mean? Does God love everybody, yes or no? Yes. He loves everybody. Is everybody saved? Yes or no? No. They're not. God's love isn't the key to salvation. God's grace. The Bible says we are saved by God's grace. This thing we don't deserve. By our faith. When we say, okay, I trust God. I believe in Jesus Christ. That he's God's son. That he died for me. And that he rose for me. Took my pain. Took my punishment. Took my suffering. Covered all of my sin. Past, present, and future. I believe all that. And when you believe that and you repent. And you say, okay, I want to I live a different way. I'm going to need help. And God's like, I'm here for you. I'll love you. This is, that is, that is where it begins. But God, Jesus, that's what Jesus said. He looks at Jeff Dahmer. And he looks at us and our dysfunction and our mess and our sin that we continually do. And he says, the wages for sin is hell. And Jesus says, Dad, God, I'll go. God's like, son, what? I'll go. Like Mackenzie, I'll do it. You take me. And I picture Jesus with God. I, he didn't have to beg him either. God knew the plan. But Jesus is like looking at you and looking at you and looking at you. And he's looking at you. He's like, Dad, I'll go. Don't take them. I know what they've done. I know what they deserve. But I'll do it. I'll do it. And God says, okay, it's going to be a hard road. And Jesus says, send me. Send me. I'll go. Don't you take my children. 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 And Jesus goes. And so many people don't accept it or believe it. God loves you. He loves you. But today, I think he's calling you to repent, saying, I don't want to do it anymore. I can't do it. I'm messed up. Like the sun, you've taken the road, and it leads to misery, the distant land. And God says, I've got a new way. He's calling you home, and no more misery, but into mercy, into love, into grace, into forgiveness, into new life. This is what God has for you. And maybe you've never committed to him, or maybe you've never fully believed in him, or maybe you've never repented. You believe, but you keep living your own life, and God says, no more. Today is the day you get back on track. That's what the commitment cards are about that Casey said. Maybe you're going to recommit or commit your life to Jesus Christ today. Because he said, I'll go. Yet so many people won't take him up on his offering, which is, that's insanity. That's what the devil wants. Don't believe him. God died, or Jesus died for you, so you might live for him. I'm going to call the rest of the team up. We're going to worship together. I pray today that you know this. God's grace is for all people, not just some people. God loves you. But to be saved by grace through faith, that's not up to God ultimately. He's done his part. He's went to the cross. It's done. You just got to receive it. It's free, but you got to, the, the son never found it. The son don't come home. If he stays in the pig pen, he's in the pig pen. Does the father love him? Yep. Is he still lost? Yep. Today is your day to decide, I want life. I want Jesus. I want forgiveness. I'm not okay. I don't know about you, but I'm not okay. I need Jesus every day of my life. He loves you, and he wants you to come home. Father, thank you so much for your word and your truth, your grace. It is a scandalous grace to think that you would cover things that we do in our world, heinous acts, 
but yet you look at us and you say, I'll go for them. I'll go for him. I'll go for her. I'll go for them all. And you died for every person that was ever created in this world and everyone that will be. But yet the Bible says that most of those people will never do their part. They'll never repent and return. That's the key. We are saved by grace, your incredible grace through our faith. No one else's, not our parents, not our friend's faith. Nobody. It's got to be our faith that we believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross, rose from the dead. That is the center of Christianity. That event alone. And I pray boldly in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, God, that people will not leave this place until they've sold out and made that decision to repent and believe those words by faith and give their life to you, God. I pray it boldly in your son. Thank you so much for your word, for your truth, for your son, for your love, and for your amazing, scandalous, incredible grace. In Jesus' name I pray and everybody says, amen.